Oh yeah, Shining, absolutely. You know, I I, I guess I could take that back. I'm I'm a fan of old old horror film. Well, not old, but horror films from the the you know the 70s, 80s. But I I don't know. I'm not into them nowadays. I don't know why. I just you know I I don't get into it. But yeah, some of the you're right. Some of the great directors were they were directing, you know, films that were uh, you know of horror status on that. But uh, but yeah yeah. And before we go on break, Dave, I want to question. I have a question. You and I we're two criminals, right? So we what would be so we're driving a third truck in Sorcerer. What where what's your name and what's your backstory? So your what what would be your nickname? So you're David Thompson. I'm Mark Hoffmeyer. What would why would you be in in Mexico? Oh God. What would uh, be your thing? That's wow. That's tough. Um, <laughs> you're a you're a booze runner, and no, you. Uh, I, I, uh, no, I, I'll, I'll say I, I I killed a coworker. Yeah, that would I would kill a coworker. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like an underground. Let's say I'm an underground fighter, and then something I, I, bad happens. I'm like, I'm on full on, like I'm on the run for the law. So yeah. I I end up somewhere in the in the South American jungle. What's, uh, what's the name of our truck? Uh, we have the Lazaro Sorcerer, and what would be ours? Like fart? <laughs> suicide jockeys. <laughs> suicide jockeys. <laughs> The uh, the expendable. No, what's like a really random name? Like what's Actually, a, what? That the expendables. Yeah, it's. I don't know. It's gotta have the some kind kicks. of the spin. That's actually yeah. No, we can we can call it the uh, uh, spin kick. The Lee the Lee Marvin experience. The Lee no. Mar- Dante. Hey, Dante. there you go. Dante. Hey, yeah. That's good. all right. So our hey. truck is Dante. The truck is Dante. Would yeah. we make the 200 mile by, trip? By the by the way, no. But, oh, by the way, <laughs> no. So <laughs> that so no. quickly. Yeah. We, we were in the first truck to go. We make um, it 50 yards. <laughs> we, by, <laughs> by the way, speaking of speaking of the trucks, the sorcerer when it blew up. Going back to the film, when it blew up, they did a close up of the only thing that was that was recognizable, and that was the front hood of the truck. And there's that devil again. Oh wow. There's the Exorcist Devil that I think it looks like the Exorcist Devil painted on the front hood, and, and it's the only thing that survived, and they do a close-up on that. Oh, and here's another story that was in Freakin's uh, Hey, wait, you're, you're diverting. How do we blow oh, up if we're in the truck oh, here, man? Like, like, you know, we're on the run. We're driving Dante. How, how do we blow up? You and I probably I, just get chatting I, I, and we I drive think, off the road. Our, our bad luck would have been – do you remember the scene where the, the Native uh, American – or the, the Indian? Yeah. Running in front of the truck, and yeah. he, and he I our luck, he would have jumped in the back of the truck and broke open one of the cases and blew us up that way. That would have been our luck. Yeah, some that, guys just goofing around, and you and I are like, no, no, around, and then he jumps in the back of the truck and goes, hey, what's this? And it opens it up and and it blows the truck up. That's the way we would go. That's <laughs> it would just funny. Be, it would just be some random a tree branch foolish, falls off. Uh, we yeah, make just, it past the bridge. And then uh, like a large coconut you know, that would, or something. That would, have been, that would have been more, I think, gut wrenching is to get past that bridge and then and then something stupid like I don't know, a squirrel dropping a, 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 a bird, nut. <laughs> <laughs> coconut, a coconut falling on a tree, and it smashes the, the box of dynamite, and the whole thing blows up. That would have been just gut wrenching. That would have been gut wrenching. So. Yeah, we definitely. Yeah, we would have. We would have blown up. I like that. Oh, no. So it's not our fault. It's fate because we were doomed to go anyway. Yeah, no, we did something bad, and and it was going to catch up with us. So yeah, that, that's totally right. So right. and so, how about this? Before you get in your story, let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll talk more sorcerer. We'll be right back. Welcome back to movies, films, and flicks, and we're we're in a pickle here. So right now, I am watching on Skype. As Dave is trying to blow up a tree that just fell through his his house. So he has a tree on there. And what he's doing is he's setting up some nitroglycerin that he had, which is crazy. And then he has it's, it's stock. two rocks. It's I mean, this is dangerous. Why don't you just leave? I mean, you are sitting on this. Isn't that a great scene? So, I mean, yeah. this well, scene there, in Sorcerer. It's, 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 it's $10,000 a piece. And these guys are desperate to get out. So, yeah, I mean, you, you want that money. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, even in the beginning, Roy Snyder was like, he thought the other truck blew up. And he was like, oh, that's 20000 a piece for both of us. I mean, he, was, <laughs> he was in the money. He didn't give a shit about anybody. Yeah, he, he was, was in uh, Nilo, I guess. Trip. Scanlon was, and Nilo. Yeah, he was in this for the money. I mean, he didn't care. And, and you know, of course, then he wins in the end. He gets 40, 40 grand. But like I said, I mean, he, he was dead. And he just didn't know it on that film. Another tidbit. Talk about directors being cocky and and. And a lot of times, you know, you get these directors that have in their contracts that, that the studio can't edit the movie. Yeah. Yeah. In his case, I think it, it was it was the same. But the, you know how studios want to throw their two cents in. Yeah. You know, they, they see a rough cut 
And then they turn around and say, okay, we'd like you to, to do this, you know, or, or whatever. Cut the language because we want to make it PG, whatever they do. In, in his case, he was called into Universal. And, and this, again, is in, a, in his autobiography. <laughs> William Freakins called into Universal to discuss uh, the film that the Universal heads had just witnessed, you know, and they, and they want to talk to him. And, of course, now he knows that he's going to get the big wigs, the moneymakers, to tell him how his film's supposed to be. So he tells his writers, and I think his director of photography, to come with him and to dress down, to, like, come unshaven, uh, wear your clothes sloppy, uh, you know, uh, put the buttons on the wrong, you know, buttonholes. I mean, just look like you're slobs. And then he's going to come in, you know, do his thing, and he goes, just just work with me. He goes, follow my lead. So he goes into the office, and here's his universal uh, big shot sitting there. They ask him, do you want something to drink? And he goes, yeah, I want a bottle of Smirnoff. So they get... He gets oh, a bottle. Of, no. he, gets, he gets a bottle of Smirnoff, and he starts. He he crack. He doesn't have a glass. He cracks open the bottle and starts drinking it in front of the the studio execs. And he and he even claims he's not much of a drinker. Um, he doesn't hold his liquor very well. But but as a, you know, he's taking swigs of, of vodka. The Universal heads are saying, "Well, we want you to to put this you know this certain thing in the movie." And so he keeps drinking and he keeps drinking as they're telling him they want some changes. The next thing you know, he falls off the chair face down and he's passed out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the end of the meeting. Turns out, after he, after he does this, one of the suggestions the Universal had for him was the odometer. So remember when Roy, yeah. Schneider, Schneider, Roy Schneider takes a chalk and writes, was it 218 miles? Yep. Above the odometer? Mm -hmm. Because Universal said they need to know how far they're going. How far are they going? What what's the length of this 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 trip? It was a brilliant. I have to admit, it was a. It really made you see how far or how little these guys were going by watching the odometer roll over, and you know it wasn't anywhere near two eighteen. And then of course when it craps out, the truck you know uh, eventually breaks down. Uh, by the way, that scene was shot in New Mexico. Yeah, you could tell it looked like that. Yeah. And it looked, world. it looked creepy. It was yeah. other otherworldly. It was beautiful. If you look when the truck dies, it's 216. The odometer says 216, meaning he's got two more miles to go. And what the fuck is he going to do? Yeah. And and then the next thing you see is him, you know, in the, coming out of the dark, carrying a box of, di of, of you know, completely dynamite that that's just it shouldn't be moved at all. And he's carrying it in the dark. And, of course, he comes to the, the oil fire, and, and these oil men grab the, the box of dynamite, and then he collapses in front of the flames, and, you know, end, end of scene. But in my mind, I'm thinking, why didn't he just walk to the, the oil drilling site, tell the guys, hey, the truck's two miles back, <laughs> and let's get, a, let's get a couple guys up here to, uh, to move the, the four or three cases of dynamite, but he has to bring one. I don't know if that was in his contract where he actually physically bring a case to the site. I know it added to the suspense, but I was kind of laughing going, I would have just walked the two miles and gone and got another truck and come back and got the uh, and he the was throwing that thing all over the place. Oh, they were slinging. I was sitting there going, I would have waited till maybe morning. Yeah, I had a chance and, to with the helicopter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that was yeah, that was their first uh, their their first thought. But yeah, I could see the vibrations that thing just blowing up. I just uh, that, even that even that log scene, that was one oh. case of dynamite. That yeah. thing was like a, a mini nuclear bomb. Yeah. That, that, was, that thing was, I mean, he even, he even had the, the plume going up above the jungle. That was a huge explosion for, for just one case of dynamite. I can't imagine what, you know, you know, two more of those things. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was, it was nutty. So, if he was trying to machete that thing though, he'd have been there now. He, he'd still no, be there. That was his, that was his, that was his, I'm going, I'm, I'm going crazy scene. Yeah. He this starts just taking machete and hacking in the, in the, in a swamp, trying. I was like, he's he's got lost it. He's so gone I, mad. That's probably why he carried that thing at the end. Just like I don't care anymore. I, no. I have seen everything known to man. And so I have a question. What do you what do you think about this? Someone I, I watched a a video, and someone said that so wh when they all go to the town in Mexico, they're in purgatory, and the fire sort of represents kind of their salvation. Do you take that? Do you think that works? I mean, that's what a lot of people have read into it, saying that they're stuck in purgatory, and then this is their oh, no, chance to move on. They're definitely in hell, but I don't think. I mean, nobody gets out of hell, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, I like I said that when I rewatched this morning, that close up in the bar, the very last scene, 
his face is ashen. I mean, the it, all life is drained out of him. And I, I, I just said to myself, he, he's dead. He just doesn't know it. Yeah. I mean, he literally looked like the Walking Dead. He just, I mean, there was, there was, he should have been dead. He should have died. And, and I mean, can, you know, he can never go home. So what's he going to do with this forty thousand dollars? Yeah. No, he knows that too. I mean, the mobs after him. Yeah. You know, and and if you watch the film, you'll you'll find out that it's you know he it, it just can't escape. Nobody can escape from your past. I think that's the whole, you know, doing this may have been the bravest thing you did in your life, but it wasn't redemption. There was no there was no redemption at the end of this film, and, and that's the other thing. Hollywood Hollywood today you you want redemption. Most films at some point the hero may fall. There's redemption at the end of the movie. There's no redemption for these guys. None. They, even if all four of them survived, there was no redemption. They're all running from something in the past that that will always catch up with them. And I think that's the one thing was, and, and you know, I use the word suicide jockeys. That was actually quoted in the in the in the movie um, that you know the helicopter pilot goes, "I, I can't do this. You you need some suicide jockeys." Mm -hmm. And that's what these guys were. They were suicide jockeys. I mean, um, and I think the one guy who might have had kind of the hero's journey was Victor or Serrano by you know Bruno Cremar. Yeah, and because he started talking about his wife, and I'm gonna get back there, and I'm gonna, like, you think he's gonna go back there and make it right and do the right thing? And then yeah, you know, and, and after watching the film, and I knew what was happening, it still was gut wrenching because as he's talking about his wife, there's there's you know they're showing the tire close up of the front tire, and you're like, oh no, <laughs> you know, it's like it looks like there there there's light at the end of the tunnel, things are gonna be okay, we're gonna make it. You know, you got happy thoughts going on, and then you're like, oh, no. And then that tire blows, and then that's it. You know, and then you turn to to <laughs> Roy, you turn to Roy, and you're thinking, what the fuck else could go wrong? And now you've got bandits in the woods yeah. that, you know, throw that in the mix, and you're like, Jesus. I, Everything <laughs> that can go wrong will. Yeah, and it's just, it was, it was doomed from the start. And I almost want to say it was an analogy of making a movie. It was almost doomed from the start. I was reading uh, something from Friedkin. I want to know what you think about this. He's like, I think it's one of the most, I think it's the one that most reflects my worldview, which could be described as cynical or jaded. On the other hand, I don't see it that way. I see it as more realistic, which is not to say that I think everything about life is as simplistically difficult and complicated as that. But I think that much of it is. We all wind up the same way, no matter what our goals or ambitions are. We have nothing at all to say about how we got into this world or where we're going to leave it. That's what Sorcerer is about. It came closest to my vision at the time. And it's the only film of mine that I wouldn't change. That's kind of gnarly to put on audiences. And yeah. I, I love it. Listen, dude, Dave, this is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. But well, I can I'm understand I'm, I'm, why. I'm, I'm, a, a absolutely nice... glad. I'm absolutely glad that, that I turned you on to it because I'm, I'm it, it's one of those films where it's a hard sell to some people. But you know, knowing you and 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 your eclectic taste in films, I, I just you know I, I knew that this was something you're going to dig, and, and I'm doing that now with, with a, another friend of mine. I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of asking, you know, have you ever seen this this particular movie? They go, no. Oh, we got to watch it. I got I got to get I got to get a new generation of people watching some of these movies. And, and you know, I, I kind of lately, you know, I've had a friend over. We've been watching films, uh, you know, during this quarantine time. Uh, and you know, catching up on old stuff. But I mean, I, I'm I'm absolutely thrilled that, that a I'm honored to be here. But I'm thrilled that I was able to turn you on to this. But I'm actually jealous that I didn't get an autographed copy of that poster. Yeah, you so, know what? I will. <laughs> I I got you on Skype right now, so I'll turn my computer so you can see it. I hate you so much right now. Yeah, you can see it right behind me, right yeah, here. Yeah. Frame. And Ma Mondo, which is part of the Alamo Draft House, has done a tremendous job on on reissuing a lot of these and making you know their versions of the posters. But man, that was. I had to do this. I had to go there. I had to. I had to see. You know, freaking for live. You know, uh, that was that was that was a bucket list for me. But uh... this is one of my favorite films because there's, there's, it's kind of twofold. And we were talking about it earlier, but just the the blood, the mud, and the beer. You can feel it every scene when there's a guy retching on the toilet, when the guy is cleaning his face with water that he doesn't want to drink, the right. sweat, the shirts, the like, the mud, the the, these characters' reactions. I mean, he got excellent performances he, from his core, like got, Amadou, Francisco Rabal, well, I mean, Bruno Kramer. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I think with all the, the casting problems, the crew that, I mean, the people that he got were, were outstanding. And by the way, a lot of those were actual villagers. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, he, he used a lot of locals. And that, that brings...